Amen. sins of the world. 
Even John said this in John 1, 29, and also verse 36, he said, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then again he saw him another time and said, looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So those shepherds were the first ones to really mix to Mary and Joseph to get to see Jesus, God's own very Lamb of God that He would provide for the salvation of others. And it's connected to the Passover as well, but you know, it can even go further back than that as being the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins because it goes back even to Adam and Eve. After they sinned, remember, they recognize their shame of their sin and so they got some leaves and they sewed it together to cover their nakedness well that wouldn't do you see for one we can't cover up our own sins only God can cover up our sins and he had he put on them coats of skin to cover what did that mean that meant that an innocent animal would have to be sacrificed give its life, that his blood would be shed, that there would be a covering for their sin. So even way back from the very beginning, that's a foreshadowing of coming of a Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, who had died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 makes it real plain. It just says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So if you want to see a connection between that Passover and, and Exodus chapter 12 to seeing Jesus as the Lamb of God in the New Testament, that verse precisely lets it be known that what, or indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. You know, the Lord instituted the Passover at that time in which he was redeeming his people out of the bondage of Egypt. Remember how God had placed ten plagues against Pharaoh and Egypt for their sin and bringing them to that place that they would bend and say, let my people go. And Pharaoh would say, God will, and then he changed his mind and wouldn't do it. Well, this was the ultimate time, the tenth plague, when it was announced that the firstborn in every household would die when the death angel passed over. But God made a way of escape for the firstborn. For God said to Moses, Moses, take this blood of a sheep, take that lamb, and take the blood off of that lamb and then sprinkle it on the doorpost of your home. And when the death angel would pass over, he would see the blood and then pass over you, and the firstborn's life would be spared. So we see from the very beginning that idea that Jesus would one day be that sacrificial lamb. That when God sees the blood, he would not take our life. The death judgment would not be upon us. A perfect picture of that really is in the wilderness wandering with the Ark of the Covenant. Because every year they would take the blood and take it into the Holy of Holies, which is the most holy place of, of that temple. And in behind it, and in there was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had what is called a mercy seat. And annually that priest, the high priest, would go in and take the blood of that sacrificial lamb. And he would sprinkle it on that mercy seat. And it would be an atonement. For their sins. It'd be a covering of their sins so they wouldn't see that sin and then they would be spared. The picture is this. Inside that Ark of the Covenant was the broken tab tablets of the law. They had broken God's laws. And those broken pieces were the ones that were put in that Ark. And so when that blood was sprinkled, over that mercy seat, God would see the blood and he would not 
see the broken law that we had sinned against God. You see, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness of sin. There's no atonement for our sin, a covering for our sins. We can't cover ourselves like Adam and Eve tried to do. We have to have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. And I'm glad that this one of the songs we sang today was about the blood of the Lamb. I want us to read that little passage of Scripture in Exodus chapter 12 that tells about that Passover. And then we're going to take this for a few moments and we're going to see the a comparison and the differences that took place between the Old Covenant, which here is given to Moses to practice this, and in the New Testament where Jesus took that and said, this is speaking of me. And I want you to do this Passover as a memorial to me now, because I am that lamb. I'm paraphrasing a lot from the scriptures here. But let's just look at, at this passage, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. And it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. Hey, i got to stop there for a minute. We're at the end of our months, aren't we? Our 12 years, the 12 months coming up, amen? And it shall be the first month of the year to you. So I feel like in some ways we're doing what they did. They began their year right by honoring the Lord as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So let's hear it. Speak, of all, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. And according to that house of his father, a lamb for a household. And it shall, and if, and if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the, I don't know, I love the rest of the verse. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation shall, of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they did eat. Now verse 12 through 14 with that. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I love this because it sounds like a song coming on, doesn't it, Jim? <laughs> okay. And when I see the blood, I will over you, and the plague shall be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Next verse. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord, and throughout your generations you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. One of the ordinances of the church is the Lord's table, along with baptism. And this table is a memorial to what Jesus did. He is the Lamb of God. It was a memorial to the men. But when Jesus got in that upper room the night before he was to go and to, to die on the cross for our sins, it is at that time that he set forth this Old Testament covenant ordinance that was a memorial to how God passed over the firstborn to male and was spared their life. He said, now I'm going to take that same thing. I'm going to take this cup that's at this Passover meal, and that cup is going to represent my blood that was shed for many for the remission of sins. And I'm going to take this bread, this broken bread, as symbolic of my body that was bruised and wounded for your transgressions, so that you'd be forgiven of your sins. And so, therefore, he set forth a new memorial from that old memorial, from that old ordinance to a new ordinance that we celebrate today. And so we are here today 
doing that very thing. I've spilled the light of that we're doing it on the first day of a brand new year. Amen. You know, just honor him. You know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Oh, would to God that we'd seek God first thing in the morning. That we'd spend time with him in prayer. That we'd spend time in the word of God to him. Oh, that we would be put him first. Oh, if we would only give him the first day of the week, which is Sunday. You know, that's the Lord's day. Sunday doesn't belong to you. It's his. It's not yours to do as you please and what you want to do. No, it's his day. It's the day in which you honor him and you acknowledge him that he is the Lord and Savior of your life. That's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Oh, that we'd only put him first at the first of the year. And we'd put the, give him the first fruits of all our prosperity that he's given to us. That we would set forth the tithe. That we would give a tenth unto the Lord. You know, the whole thing is about putting God first. Putting God first. When we come to this Lord's table, really ought to be a new commitment. Lord, we're doing this the first of the year. And we're making a commitment right now to put you first and far more in my life. Nothing else is going to separate it. You will be first. Everything else will be cast aside. What's really important, my priorities, is you being number one in my life. And so we see that that's what that was instituted. And as we look here, we know that Jesus is our Passover land. And we're celebrating him today. Just to pick up a verse of scripture that kind of enlightens us for our time and our age is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, and then we'll skip to verse 21 after that next 19th verse. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 21. Who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. The first point that he's making right there is our hope of salvation is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as being the Lamb of God. You can't purchase it with silver and gold. You can't do it by the tradition of your fathers, what people have done religiously over the years. They think they do this, they do that, if they do certain things, and they'll merit heaven and they'll be in, invited. As a matter of fact, talking about you can't buy with silver and gold, but it's with his precious blood he bought us. That's something you just can't purchase, folks. Now I'll say this as well. We've been studying Isaiah on Wednesday nights. And one of the invitations that Isaiah or God really gives, he says, come and buy salvation without money. Come and buy salvation without cost. When you buy something, what are you doing? You're acquiring something. And what's he saying here? You're acquiring salvation at no cost to you. But it did cost Jesus everything. On the cross right. Amen. When he died for your sins. With his precious blood. Yes. All of our hope is based in him through faith. He's our only hope of salvation. One of the things that he brought out in that passage that he read to you. That he was without spot or blemish. In Exodus 12, 5. They would, it said he shall have a a lamb without blemish or male and, and those shepherds that, that were out in the field taking care of the temple sheep there came a period of time when it got ready for the Passover feast that they would set those sheep aside for a certain amount of days and they would observe them they would even inspect them to make sure they did not have one spot or one blemish in other words they were perfect they were sound because, you see, if they were not perfect, then they were not qualified to be sheep offered unto God. 
by the same token, the Lord Jesus Christ was observed in his life ministry. He was thoroughly inspected. Matter of fact, he was scrutinized with, with real sincere ugliness from the, the religious leaders, the hierarchy. You know, they looked to catch him in his word. They might find fault in him, but yet they could find no fault in him. Matter of fact, when it came to that kangaroo court the night before where they claimed that he was, uh, you know, worthy of death, they had to get false witnesses to testify because nobody knew anything on him. He was perfect. We even looked when they took him to Pilate. Pilate examined him and says, I find no fault with this man. And I even think in the observation of the centurion that stood around that cross, when it was all said and done, he saw what took place. He said, true, this is the Son of God. Amen. <laughs> He's a real McCoy. He's who he says he is. He's perfect in all his ways. Now, something to draw from that shepherd out of the field is that this angle is letting them know, hey, you'll know, here's a sign, you'll know the baby I'm talking about. When you get there, you're going to find this little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he'll be lying in a manger or a feed trough, okay? You can't miss it, okay? Uh, and you know what were those, that cloth that they used, that swaddling cloth? Those shepherds were trying to produce perfect sheep. I'm going to mic. I'm quoting somebody from this again, okay? And they would take that swaddling clothes and they'd wrap it around each of the little lamb's legs so that they would never get scratched or wounded or bruised. So it would remain perfect so it could be worthy of a sacrifice unto the Holy God. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was perfect in all his ways. When we look at him, we behold him full of grace and full of truth. Amazing. No one ever liked him before. There's none besides him who walked like Jesus walked and talked like Jesus talked and thought like Jesus thought and had the attitude like Jesus had. And we're to learn from him to be like him. You know, I see another thing here that's a comparison and maybe a contrast, but it is a contrast, that in that Old Testament Passover, the people had to furnish the sacrificial lamb. They got the lamb, and if somebody else couldn't, and they had trouble with it, shared that lamb with a neighbor next door, okay? And so, they were the ones that had to provide. But let me tell you something, yes. God himself provided the Lamb of God. It was God's gift to mankind for salvation. To offer his son, his only son, his beloved son, whom he loved dearly, to be a sacrifice for our sins. It was a gift. The Lamb of God was a gift from God. You know, there's a similar story that goes along with that. It's found over in Genesis chapter 22 where, remember, God once tested Abraham and his faith. And he came to Abraham and said, uh, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Your son, your only son, whom you love. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Immediately, Abraham began to do what God instructed him to do. And as they were going to a certain place that God would show them that he would offer his only son, he'd take him with him all the firewood that he would need. And the little son was walking along beside him and said, Dad, hey, we got everything we need for sacrifices of the lamb. <laughs> Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? God himself will offer the sacrifice of the lamb. God provided that lamb. God brought that lamb. It was God's gift. And if you go over later and you read in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find out that there was some good explanation as to why Abraham was willing 
willing to go out for his only sacrifice, I mean, offer his son as a sacrifice and be loved because he thought deep in his heart by faith. God promised me that by his seed would be generations to come after me. And God can't lie. If I kill my son, he's got to raise him from the dead. Isn't that another beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who died for us and on the third day he arose victorious the son that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son? Yes, we see that it is a gift from God to save men from their sins. Now here's one that I'm going to close with. There is one comparison here in the Old Testament and the New Testament Passover. This whole issue is a matter of life or death. Either you'll live by this or you'll die by this. The blood had to be applied if your life was to be spared. If they didn't have that blood on that doorpost when the angel passed by, sure enough, the firstborn was dead, and that's exactly what happened to Pharaoh and his beloved son. He died because he didn't apply the blood. The same way for us today. If we do not apply the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, I need your blood as atonement to cover my sins. I've broken your laws. Then we are doomed. If we were not in that place in which we could come to God and say, Lord, I need your blood. Because I have a sin debt that I cannot pay. It's too big for me to pay. And Christ, <coughs> if you don't pay that price for me, you see, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or remitting of your sins. Amen. It won't ever be paid off. It's required. If he didn't pay the price, that's why every one of us here today, and I believe within my heart, I can't think of anybody here that I don't think is saved. I might wonder about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but, then I, but every one of you here is because you have what? Applied the blood of Christ. Amen. You came to him as a sinner and said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. If your shed, your blood was shed for me. And I'm asking you to say thank you. You have applied the blood. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you this. Have you though? I don't know everybody's heart. I can only go by your profession. And you may look like it, but only God knows and only you know if you really have applied the blood of Christ or not. Has there been a time? look back to you apply the blood of Christ, that you know him personally as your Savior. The Bible says this, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. Your sin will not be cleansed apart from applying the blood of Christ. John 3, 36 plainly says, he that believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. The believer in Christ is saved by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb of God is God's gift to us today. There's one passage of Scripture that I want to sum it up with. And that's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. It tells us our position, where we are, because we've applied the blood. Verse 11 says, And every priest stands in ministry daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What's he referring to? All those Old Covenant, Old Testament rules and regulations of taking those lambs every year and shedding. Those lambs are just a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God. You know, it was, it was just a type that's to come. But those sacrifices could not ever save anybody. And then verse 12 says, But this man referred to the Lamb of God after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemy 
things are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If you've applied the blood, something really happened to you. <laughs> He's perfected you. You know, Jesus wants one day to present us faultless before his presence. Amen. Before the holy, holy God, he's going to look at us as if we're perfect. In other words, he's declared us righteous. We've been justified. We've been reconciled to God. And he's looking for that day to be perfected forever. And that you've been sanctified. That means you've been set aside as his own very special people. You are his inheritance. He fought you with his blood. No, you're not, but you're not, you're not of your own. You belong to Christ. You're his heritage. You're indebted to him. You can never do enough for him. For he's chose to save you and give himself for you on that cross by shedding his blood as the Lamb of God. Let's pause for a moment and just adore him and appreciate him. As the Lamb of God, with their head bowed and their eyes closed, I'm going to let you have this little quiet time with God, and you just start thanking. Matter of fact, when we come to the Lord's table, we don't want to come with unworthy. We want to get everything right with God. If there's any sin, you confess it now. If there's something you're dealing with, you know it's not right. You're not doing it right. You're not putting it first. This would be a good time to say, Lord. I'm going to start obeying you because I belong to you. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'll be quiet and let you have a quiet time. Thank you for your sacrifice as being the Lamb of God in 
took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink it all of you. We're going to do that step by step. We're going to take the bread first, and then we're going to wait and we'll take it together as a church family.
Lord Jesus, as we hold this cup in our hand, we know that this cup was the better cup. The cup that you asked the Father that we not will this cup be passed from you. But Lord Jesus, you were willing to endure the wrath of this cup, which caused the sin of your innocent blood, the one who knew no sin, the one who had no God in him. And Lord, you shed your innocent blood that we, the guilty, would be set free. That we not have bared the wrath of God. Instead, we be we given life. Lord, we be blessed by being, being called the children of God, which we don't deserve. Lord, we just thank you for what you did when you shed your blood for us. Thank you for paying the debt. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All of this. Thank you. We are going to have an invitation at this time. We're not. Some 